Debbie. How's it going? It is going fine. Grant, you had me spellbound. My first question is, when do I get a sequel? This ending is killer. It is a perfect setup. I already want a sequel. I was so invested in this it's, film. I agree. This, um, it's a great question. Um, it's, you know, we always, if we have the opportunity to set up a sequel, and, you know, we might as well. And we always had the idea of revealing at the end that Mel actually answers someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we met with Mel, when he got to Georgia, and we talked about the final scene with him, he actually kind of teed up to us what a sequel might entail, which was <laughs> diverting my expectations and Tyler's expectations, but really, really smart. Um, you know, I hope this movie does well, um, and it would be really interesting if we did a sequel. I think if we did, I'd, I'd want to kind of up it across the board, uh, you know, more action, you know, there was one moment in this movie that I really thought could have used a car chase scene, and that was when our heroes get away from the sort of crime scene. Yes. Um, and, are, and are going to the airport. And I just think with a bulkier budget, that's something that would have been the first thing to go in was a good car chase there, mm -hmm. you know, being chased by Belgian uh, police cops and uh, cars. Um, so we'll see. Um, I think that it would be really interesting to do that. Yeah, and I think the car chase, that was one thing I was missing here because you've got action pumping on so many levels. You've got a lot of man-on-man -man combat. You've got a lot of pyrotechnics and explosions. You've got great firefights happening. You have intimate firefights. Two bullets to the head, you're gone. But yeah, we were missing a car chase. So yeah, I agree with you. That would be a great addition with a sequel. But this whole story... The entire thing, it's a riveting thriller, it's cat and mouse. You build the anticipation and tension so well. It's like a chess game um, with constant checks in, uh, in play. We got pawns falling, knights falling, queens keep moving. Someone's protecting the king in the castle. Who is the king? It's a very much a pay attention movie, but it's a fun pay attention movie. And the intrigue is spectacular. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, you know, I do view these things, um, this movie and the characters as chess pieces. Um, and obviously you think the whole time that Mel's character, Olsen, is the queen, um, so to speak. And at the end, we realize it's just not. He's probably, you know, a third-ranking official. You know, he's calling someone above him who we can interpret just based off the visuals and sounds of where that person is living, that, you know, they are senior to Mel's character. Yeah. And, you know, in an ensemble movie, you have to make it feel that every character is individualized and serves his or her own purpose. Uh, too many characters in ensemble movies blend together, a little bit of redundancy. So what was important here was to, in the script, individualize the characters, cast people who are, you know, had their own you know, their own uh, sort of way of acting and their own way of interpreting things. Uh, I think Reese Coiro as Reese is a really good example of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that Katie Cassie as Miller is a good example of that. Um, and then you give them the backstories they need to have and you focus on them individually. And it really will become clear exactly what their role is on the chessboard. And I think, you know, here you realize that you have Olsen at the top, you have Visser under him, and you have Bill and Harris, you know, under them. Mm -hmm. And then way, way, way down under Olsen is Kavinsky, Miller, and Reese. And then, of course, you have Omar somewhere in there, Barkov's character. Yeah. But what was a really important moment for me to add into the screenplay, like I did, was towards the end when Visser calls Olsen during the firefight, kind of looking for backup, looking for help. And she calls him, and he doesn't answer. <laughs> and that's, she has this moment of realization that washes over her face of realizing she's been played just like everybody else, that she's a chess piece just like everybody else, whereas she's convinced herself for the past you know few months or a few years of her career with Olsen that she was special. And she realizes she's just been played and she's just as worthless to him as everyone else. Um, so the idea of chess pieces was um, really important. And maybe that moves us into uh, a, a chess a famous chess scene in Harry Potter and therefore Jason Isaac, who yes. <laughs> I think does a magnificent job of playing a person who is a chess piece, but also has a lot of free will. Mm -hmm. Most characters in this movie don't have much free will because they do follow orders, whereas he 
he's senior enough to know that his gut is probably better than some of the orders he's going to be given. But mm-hmm. at the same time, he does sort of honor his uh, his ranking, and that Olson outranks him. And you know, on their call, he sort of just accepts what Olson's telling him, despite that he doesn't want to. What I love about Jason's character of Bill, and I think it's so key here, he and Mel, Olson and Bill, both represent the older the older school. Yeah. Of spying of the spy world and then you've got Miller Kavinsky and Reese the young and Visser the younger generation Visser thinks she knows more than anybody and she's indispensable Miller Kavinsky and Reese have been pitted against each other by Visser and Olsen essentially but then you've got Bill who is very old school and still has a code of ethics and a code of morals that luckily we do see that transfer to Harris because Dermot plays this his role so well. I think this is one of Dermot's best performances in his career because at first you're not quite sure and this is kudos to David your cameraman your your DP because you've got some great close-ups during the interrogation scenes where you're cutting back and forth and especially when Visser goes into Omar and cutting between Harris's face, Bill's face, the monitors, going back into the interrogation room, and you see the looks that Dermot brings, and you're very suspect. Does he know what's, is something up? Is he on the same page with Bill? Is he really going along with Visser's idea? It's really interesting, and then to see how it plays out, and what he does, he picks up that mantle of morals and ethics, and what's right. And that's something that really Absolutely. stands out in this film, Grant. And you've done such an amazing job with that. Absolutely amazing. Really appreciate it. I'm so curious, you know, because this is essentially nonlinear. I love the structure that as we go back in time and we meet each one of our people as they're getting hired. So we're essentially getting some backstory here as to what they thought they were stepping into. And then to watch these transitions so that we're essentially going backwards before everybody gets on the same page. We, you know, we keep going back, we come to the present, we go back to when this one was hired, and then finally everybody gets on the same page in the plane. How challenging was that for you in working with your editor, with Charlie Porter? in finding that balance, because that's precarious. Yeah, you know, it's, so it, what was really the fundamental challenge and question of this movie, all the way back to the screenplay stage, was it's hard to develop characters in a movie that have characters who are not allowed to divulge information about themselves, right? You know, you can't yep. have our heroes talking about their history and their background openly because people on such a mission would never do that. They wouldn't even be allowed to do that. But... I was concerned that them getting to know each other on the plane would be too late in the game to get to know one another. Um, and we, at that point, will have not cared enough and we will have not had a quick buy-in. So I challenged Tyler and myself and my editor when we were in prep to figure out ways to develop our characters prior to them really getting to know each other on the plane. And what we decided was that they could all make hints about their, you know, their backgrounds, their true selves to one another, even if the other characters weren't really aware that they were being given a nugget. A great example is, you know, Katie, uh, who plays Miller, when she's in the car on the stakeout, mentions that she was driving for Uber really yeah. recently, which, of course, to the audience is suggesting this is either her first mission or her early mission, and that she isn't exactly the AT is sort of a new contracted person uh, who doesn't have much experience. But the line is sort of so seemingly weird that Kavinsky doesn't believe her. So that was a attempt that I made to tell the audience something about her character, but not tell Kavinsky because he doesn't believe her. Right. Um, and he reasonably doesn't because how could he believe that someone who was driving for Uber six months ago is somehow on this mission with him? But then we have a more subtle example in... Uh, about a minute or two later when Reese is giving Manson and Bundy the weapons and he has trouble unzipping the bag. 
for me, that is a little hint that I'm giving to the audience that, like, this guy is not smooth and that this team isn't smooth. This isn't Ethan Hunt. This isn't Jack Bauer. This isn't most action movies where they're all experts, everything is smooth and easy. Um, I needed to convey to the audience some of those moments so you can start to understand things about these characters, even if it's in a subtle way. And by the time you get to the plane and they start opening up to one another, which is one of my favorite scenes, you don't feel like it's the first time you're getting to know these characters. You actually feel like mm-hmm. you have a little bit of insight into who they are, and this is the first and natural moment where they're actually going to open up. Because before this, they had no reason to. They were tight-lipped, they were told to be tight-lipped, but they're now in such a weird predicament that they've decided it can't hurt for us to talk about ourselves and kind of get to know one another and figure out you know, who we're in the shit with, as I think Reese says. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was challenging. How do you develop characters that aren't allowed to talk about themselves? Um, but I think we did a good job, and I think that our actors are also likable in their various roles, especially our heroes, that even if you aren't being told so much information about them, the actors themselves are, you know, getting a lot of audience buy-in. Oh, you are you are along for the ride. I mean, and I have to commend you. Your casting of Reese Caro as Reese, I got he adds moments of lightness because you can't just have this intensity build and build and build. You got to have a release somewhere, and he gives us that in some respects with his "fuck it, let's go for it." And that works so well because it also helps bond Miller, Kavinsky, and Reese, and even Harris. And I love, you know, your casting is really well done there with our heroes, with Dermot, with Jason, with Mel. And Barkat, I got to say, I'm so thrilled because I remember Captain Phillips, he could barely speak any English. He's got some great dialogue here that really just breaks your heart and has you wondering, is he being set up? You really wonder. Your whole construct here with your casting, with your characters is great. And then you compound that. Your visual tonal bandwidth and your visual grammar is impeccable. What you and David have come up with visually, you keep us in, we've got icy bluish tones in the plane and in flashbacks to a point that make us feel everything's shrouded. That there's a cloud over things. Things are are not. We're not seeing everything, and then you counter that with the inky blue blacks and the shootouts pumped up with the heat of fire glow. We've got that final act with in Washington D.C. That suddenly it's bright, bright, bright. G.E. white light bulb bright, and the camera. It your frame goes out wider. It's like okay, the blinders are off. Everyone now sees Olsen for who he is. And this is so beautifully constructed, Grant. I'm curious, what were your thoughts in working with David to come up with this visual grammar with very specific framing of the camera and using really vacillating between important close-ups, your mids, and then very few wide-wides? Because I think it just works so well with this whole cloak and dagger cat and mouse game that's happening. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, yeah, you know, for us, one of the uh, many theses of this movie was that despite that it is an action movie, there's no reason why we can't make it really visually thoughtful. Uh, we, you know, we felt that a lot of movies in this genre are just prioritizing the cast and the action and really nothing else. And that, you know, People nowadays are seemingly only putting much visual or, you know, score uh, kind of thought into Sundance type of movies. And I said, there's no reason why we can't do that here. And that then allowed us to really explore our characters and our settings in a much more thoughtful and elevated way than I think a lot of our counterparts do. And so that starts with sort of our different characters um, and thinking about different visual or audio themes that each of them bring. Um, for us, the airplane was a really good way to do that. Mm-hmm. Because I think a lot of movies on a private plane would have had a sort of typical airplane color, you know, sort of that, just a stale sort of white and sort of a sterile feeling to it. Um, and I felt that because these three are our heroes, that kind of cloaking them in this blue was a very natural thing for me to do to identify them uh, sort of versus when the, our heroes are meeting individually with Olsen, if you look very closely, I've actually 
actually put a little bit of red into Mel's pupil. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very subtle, but that for me, and I, I didn't want to hit the audience over the head that he's going to be a villain, but I did want to differentiate our heroes from him and give a sort of certain thought to each color with each character. And then we go to the black site where everything's really muddy mm-hmm. and green and dark. And um, I, it's all about individualizing. And the score is similar where our heroes have a bit of a theme that plays three to five times and derivations of it play a few times. But then our black site doesn't really have a thematic score. It has more sort of atmospheric gore similar to Sicario. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have our Olsen interviews, which don't really have much of anything right. at all and, but with score. And that's all purposeful. You know, you, you, I think that the actors are great, the action is great, the script is great. But if you're able to bring all the tools of filmmaking to elevate each aspect of your story, why not? Like, you know, the tools are there. We, we had these great cameras. We had a great gaffer. We had a great cinematographer. We have a great composer and a great editor. Let's bring all those things to the fore uh, and, you know, accentuate all the things I'm trying to get across. And, you know, this was the first movie that I have contemplated that I really thought handheld was the way to go. Um, usually I am someone who likes the more static sort of painting-like framework, and here I just thought, no, we have to feel like we're in this with these guys, mm-hmm. and nothing is settled, and therefore everything should be handheld. But, you know, when we're in the interviews with Olsen, the camera's more locked off, yeah. and I did want to sort of differentiate it, but the big difference in those scenes is that while the cameras are pretty locked off for the most part, we're quite dirty when we're on uh, the over-the-shoulder of Olsen facing at our heroes. And it sort of gives us that born ultimatum feel. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the different sort of framework for each plot line, and there are all these fun things you can do to get the point across that you're trying to get across and, you know, and make the experience very active and not stale. And I think that a lot of TV and movies we're seeing these days have a lot of clean wides or a lot of clean mediums on characters. I find it very stale. And I think that in a movie like this, that's so character driven. You do want to put the camera right up to the characters and you do want to have a lot of dirties and you want to have some things that just don't look clean. Mm -hmm. Don't even look as clean as you wanted them to be. And just, it gives it that sort of natural grounded feeling. And that was really important here. The way you've done this and, and, the distinction you're actually creating some great visual motifs with the camera which you don't see too often each character we have a different kind of visual motif similar to score motifs the hero motif or the individual what we hear you know when Olsen is around versus what we hear when Miller Kavinsky and and Reese are around I love the thought that you put into this for the visuals because the metaphor when you get that dirtier look that says a lot it says a lot and because the dirtier look comes from the over the shoulder behind Olsen looking at these candidates individually you get a sense of something's off balance with him something about this interview is off balance it's not all that it seems to be. And you follow this through. And with your big set pieces, we want to be in that firefight. We want to be boots on the ground with them. And you make us feel that way. From beginning to end, Grant, you have, it, your thought is so evident in this film with what you have done cinematically. And I just love it. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm excited uh, that you felt that way about it, and I certainly hope that other people do because you've hit the nail on the head about our intention. I am curious with your score, because as you said, very, whenever we've got Olsen on screen, it's almost non-existent. I wasn't even cognizant of score when he's interviewing people. You're so focused on what he's saying and in typical Mel Gibson fashion the expressiveness of his eyes and the you know a little bit of Martin Riggs comes in there a lot of stone banks from Expendables 3 comes in there he can be all over the map and you're trying to 
to figure out what he's doing. But so you're, I wasn't even cognizant of score during those particular moments. But what, but for the rest of the film, because there are some very specific motifs happening, what were you looking for musically from your composer, from Kylie Norton? Yeah, you know, when we're on Mel, um, there's not too many moments of score, and I sort of analogize that to in Harry Potter, when the Dementors come, everything starts getting really frozen, like mm -hmm. the windows on the uh, train and the sort of terrain, and similarly, I think Mel's character sort of has that effect where he sort of makes it so a score can't exist uh, because his presence is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, but when we, you know, Kylie and I talked about this, I said off the bat that I wanted our heroes to have a thematic score, something that I think just isn't as common nowadays. Um, and I cited Lauren Bell, especially Mission Impossible Fallout, um, where the whole score is basically a derivation of the Mission Impossible theme song, you know, re that was rebranded by Lauren. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the actual theme song itself only plays every time. But you feel like it's playing the whole time because there's just these little riffs on it. Um, and I said I wanted him to create a really interesting theme for our heroes, but to tease our audience with it a bunch and really only play it, you know, three or four times and sort of play riffs on it the rest. And then, you know, for our black site, I definitely did say the more atmospheric, the kind of Sicario type of score, which is a lot more common nowadays, you know, the sort of mood yeah. and feel score versus something that actually is sort of lyrical, you know, has a sort of uh, melodic uh, aspect to it. Um, and that's just a really good way to... Um, separate the two timelines. And there's no way that the Black Side would have a thematic score. Um, it's just, it's so atmospheric and moody that I just wanted to lean into something kind of cold and distant. Um, whereas the heroes, you know, they are, I do view them more analogous to the MO of like a Mission Impossible Fallout versus a Sicario. Um, and I did need to individualize the two plot lines and mm -hmm. make sure there weren't any redundancies. And as you said, just like Reese keeps things very fresh with his humor and his wit. Mm -hmm. Similarly, I couldn't have the two plot lines be too similar to one another. Otherwise, it would get stale. Right. On every level, Grant, this is just, I just love this film, and I love what you put into it and your execution. I am curious, though. This is your second feature directorial. You've got a lot of production producing under your belt. And it shows in this film, the considerations of a, of a boots-on-the-ground producer, it shows with your direction of this film and in this script. You're not wasting time or, or wasting money, uh, so to speak. But I'm curious, what did you, as a filmmaker, as a director, take away from this film, from this production, and learn about yourself as a director that you can take forward into future directorial efforts, hopefully a sequel. Yeah, um, I, I think that um, I've always been a visual storyteller, and I think, as I said earlier, that that has sort of been relegated in a lot of uh, places in the industry to sort of indie and art house movies. And I just didn't feel that that was true, and I felt that I could take my visual storytelling into a genre like this. Mm -hmm. And this was the a great example of sort of proving that hypothesis correct because I was able to do that. And one of the things I learned along the way is that the better you get at storytelling with pure visuals, um, sort of pure cinema like Hitchcock would sort of uh, advocate for, the dialogue becomes a little bit less necessary. Um, you know, my other work is a little bit more talk heavy, uh, inspired by Whit Stillman and Aaron Sorkin and David Mamet. But in the more I've made movies, the more I've realized that you don't actually need as much dialogue as you might think, that you can convey a lot of things with just the image. Mm -hmm. And I was able to learn here even more um, than I thought going in just how much you can convey with a, with a visual image versus accompanying it with dialogue or accompanying it with voiceover like a lot of movies do, um, which I, I really can't stand. So I um, going into the next film, whether it's an action movie or whether it's a comedy or whatever it is, knowing that something that is just visual itself can convey the message. It can also be funny. You know, some of the great comedic bits out 
there, you know, in all of history, if you think about like Chaplin, were purely visual. That's it. No audio. And, um, and I think that was a huge lesson learned here was just how far you can take it. And I think a scene that people resonate um, that resonates with people in this film is when Visser is in the forest towards the end of the movie trying to find Harris and kill Harris. That scene, I, I wrote the scene from scratch. I very much planned that one out maybe as a special darling of mine because <laughs> I thought that just like we had had so much action in the 10 minutes before that, we needed a breath. And I very much thought of a horror film and that sort of stalker POV and how in a movie like Halloween when we're in the stalker POV, nothing's being said. Right. It's just, you know, just we see long lens. We see, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis on a terrace or on a porch. You know, there's just, you, you're conveying so much to the audience with a very simple image, which is clearly the camera's behind the bushes and we're looking at Jamie Lee Curtis from a distance. And that tells us so much. And I certainly wanted to convey that in that final scene there between Visser and Harris. And really almost nothing is said, but, and that creates tension, but we also sort of know what I'm trying to say by having it, just filming it the way I filmed it. And that was awesome to learn those lessons and see when it works, see when it didn't work. And uh, I think that's the biggest thing I'll carry through to the next. And I'm glad you mentioned that scene because that scene truly... You make the most of negative space. It plays to your advantage with tension. The camera dutches up and at Harris. Really, really well done. And again, it's like using negative space here, which is something a lot of directors forget to use. And you, you just hit everything. Hit the nail on the head with it all, Grant. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. So oh, Grant. Thank you so, so much. I hope we get to talk again in the future. Maybe for a sequel, uh, but I'll talk to you about any film you make. Let me tell you, I just love your cinematic voice. I really do. And I can't wait for the next one. Thank you. I can't, I can't either. 